Town of Hinton respectfully acknowledges that it is located on Treaty 6 territory in Métis Nation Region Number 4. These are the traditional territories and ancestral lands of Indigenous peoples, including the Plains Creek First Nations, Assiniwachi, Winnowak, Rocky Mountain First Nations, Stony, Sutina, Nakota, Denisulin, Salto, Mountain Métis, Michi, and many other communities that continue to enrich the land on which the town of Hinton was established. With this sentiment, I'd like to call today's Committee of the Whole meeting to order. Council, are there any changes to the agenda? Councillor Haas? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if Council would entertain adding mutual performance as we uh, didn't complete it last week and thought this was a good opportunity to do that. So I'd like to add that to the agenda uh, under uh, closed session, please. 8.3. mutual performance discussion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Haas. Council, any other changes? Non administration. Nothing, sir. Council, any discussion or motions? Council, again. I'd like to move that we adopt the agenda of the committee, pardon me, the agenda for the committee of the whole meeting for April 26th as amended. Thank you, Councillor Lagoon. Council, all those in favor? That brings us to citizens' minute with council. Are there any citizens here who would like to speak today? No. Uh, any citizens oh, joining? Do yeah. They don't have to be there. <laughs> any citizens via Zoom would like to speak? No, there's not. Okay, thank you. That brings us to our first delegation presentation for today. Gerard Redman Community Catholic School Crosswalk Parent Advisory Committee. Thanks so much for having us. Do you want to say it or you, oh, go ahead? Oh, okay. Um, so as most of you are aware, uh, we have some issues in front of Gerard Redmond School. Um, the crosswalk there is um, quite dangerous, actually. There's uh, a big danger there. Since mid-2019, I've kind of been back and forth with emails with the town um, just to address the, the crosswalks. Um, they're not quite visible. Um, as you'll see in a small little slideshow in a moment. Uh, and we've put in a request to perhaps um, if those overhanging crosswalks can, can be uh, brought in there with um, perhaps some speed bumps, um, proper signage. Uh, it was noticed that the crosswalk signage isn't really visible to drivers. And with having novice drivers, because it is a high school, so there's those beginners that are just learning to drive. And uh, some of them, I guess, believe they're at Daytona. <laughs> so they're speeding away. And also it's on a curve. So you're coming up to a curve and where the school buses have to park, the crosswalk goes in between them. So there's a lot of things going on for the drivers. And if you add in weather, the late, like the darker mornings in winter, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. We have had bylaw officers present. Um, there have been a lot of near misses. A lot of children have almost been hit. And um, we were also looking at the crosswalks at the corner of the intersection of um, Lean and Mountain Street. We feel they're on the wrong side of the street. They should be on the west side, right? Yeah. Um, also to right now, they are currently, um, one is covered by trees. So you can't really see it when it is flashing. And that's also another disaster waiting to happen. We feel that the, the lights that are currently there don't really serve very many kids. It would better serve kids if it was on the other side. Yeah, um, not really. I mean, uh, something sort of more complication. You mentioned a couple things. One was that the fact that we have new drivers, and that's definitely a concern. Um, this car that you see here, this SUV, is actually there. It lives there. So I believe that the people who uh, own the SUV live in the house right there. You can go to the next one. Thank you. Um, so we kind of, I kind of looked at, okay, what's the height of that? I went out and measured it to see, and to see. So. You can't see kids that are standing there and you can see the sign on the other side coming this way. It's even more dangerous coming the other way because you're coming around a corner um, and we've had people drive by with 
this with the buses there with the stop signs out with the arms down and drive by every single bus and I have told the RCMP um, a couple of times about those kinds of things. They said, unless I bought it on videotape, there was nothing I could do about it. Um, we have talked to bylaw and they definitely are a presence there. And I really do appreciate that. The RCMP have been out a lot more, but we have really little kids. So if you look at, for example, the average height of a fifth grader, I measured a couple that are 110 centimeters. If you go to the next one, and we have two little girls who live on the other side of the street that cross here every single morning. So in the winter time, say from November until about February, um, I've actually had to get lights that my staff uses with their high vis vests that they have on. And we've now put flashing lights because people don't see us with high vis vests on, right? And so as we're going to, trying to get those kids across the street to catch the bus, um, we're putting ourselves in danger and there has been near misses even with staff, even with adults who are careful. So this is an ongoing concern. I mean, the sign is there and the crosswalk is painted, but in the winter time, there's no crosswalk painted. They don't see that. And the sign, although it's there, it's, it's, it's just not large enough. And we're kind of looking for something that looks more like um, the corner of Moline and Mountain Street, no, College and Mountain Street, that overhanging one like they have at Mountain View, for example. And right? the ones that were installed at St. Gregory. Well. Right. Yeah. Um, just to have that visibility a little bit more because we've had uh, several kids. We had a kid actually get hit by a car and ended up with a brain injury um, that was going across um, Mountain Street into Bristler area that happened a few years ago. So it's not just speculation that this could happen. It actually has happened to our school and to our students. Um, and so we would just like really appreciate sort of the opportunity to, to put this forth to you again. Um, I know that this started with my predecessor's predecessor. I'm the principal of the school. So this is like we're now into a third principal who's now still supporting our PUC and trying to, to bring this to your attention and hopefully um, rectify the situation. And I think that was a minute. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to fill the <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was like, you, you have a minute with it. I'm like, I can speak for the That's not a problem for me. Um, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Council. Councilor Taylor. I can't quite remember what those other ones you're talking about look like. I, I remember what the Mountain View one, because it's a really bright flash. Right, and it goes across the road. Oh, it goes all the way It overhangs and goes across the road. Yeah. So you you can, I mean, if you miss that. Because the Mountain View one is so uh, bright and flashy, right? Yeah. Yes. you got to be flying this time. Well, and the one on Mountain Street, though, too, isn't an overhanging one. It's still just one on the side of the road. The one on Mountain. And Mountain and Bristler yeah. and the like that. Yeah. This yeah. would be equally as visible. I'd have to look at those. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, it, I'd invite you to, if you want to come and stop it in the office, I'll take you on a tour and kind of show you some of the issues that we have and how little the kids are that come and catch the bus there because it's sort of a, a depot for our kids going to St. Greg's. So we have kindergarten kids that, and they they just don't look. They, they you know, they get excited to catch the bus and, and they're zipping out. And, and so there's all, like, we're there and we supervise. But like I said, it's 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 just a potential accident, and I don't want to see that happen to anyone's children. So. Uh, same, like a follow up or different one? Yeah. Kind of all bunch of different. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ross. Yeah, just a, I have a couple of questions, but one in particular with the Mountain View, the. With that crosswalk, when you say the other side of the road, are you talking about like it's where the trees are now, but on the other side, of, like keep it on that street, just push them over onto the other side? Yes, yeah, the one on okay. Mountain Street in Moline. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it should just be right across that street. So then the kids don't have to cross the street again to, to get to our school. So you got the same side as our school is. Yeah, there's a lot of people okay. coming. Yeah, from the okay. larger portion of Mountain Street coming this way to the school. Okay, so. Okay, that makes sense. Great, thank you. I'll get back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Right. Councillor Taylor, Councillor Magoon, and Councillor Ross. What about just making traffic on one side of the road? Like that road always seems to have uh, a ton of traffic on both sides of the road. So you mean like, like stop parking on one school, side? During school hours, like wouldn't that be equally as uh, make things safe? I, like, why would you propose that too? Um, I suppose because uh, I'm not sure that the neighbors wouldn't want the street parking. Yeah. That would be, I, I think if you block that off all during the day from, I mean, probably what, eight till four, I don't know what your neighbors would say about that. I suspect they would not be very happy with our school if we made that no parking during the day. Although, 
I mean, our kids have enough parking within our school ground, um, but I know the neighbors don't because they park in our school ground too. Also too, I think flashing lights gets everybody's attention. And it's the nighttime. I mean, really it is dark at our school until probably quarter to eight and our kids arrive between eight o'clock and eight twenty generally. And in like those winter months, it's it is nighttime up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, so, I mean, during the winter, that crosswalk is essentially covered in snow. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you would be the only school in town with elementary age students that don't have an overhanging flashing correct. light system. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Councilor Magoo, Councilor Ross. I'm just curious, and, and maybe this is more to administration too, I don't know, but if we were to set them up there, I'm wondering, like, when you come around the other way around the curve, is there enough room that you're coming around that you to see the flashing lights and get stopped there? So I'm just curious if that's, if that's, you know, like, would there have to be something on the other side of the curve to at least? Uh, well, are they not two-sided, the overhanging flashing? Well, they're two-sided, but I'm just wondering if people coming around the curve you're coming around the curve, you, and then to you, all of a sudden, boom! You yeah. see around the curve, you see. But it, I'm trying to think of how much distance is there. But so there seems like enough. But if you want to go back to the picture, yeah, I did propose to before, uh, perhaps just a little flashing light saying "crosswalk and use" on the other side of the curve. Yeah, but I don't see the. Um, I can certainly the direction or distance. I would say it's approximately what would it be? How many meters? Oh, maybe like. 25 yards ish put that into metrics so 20 meters maybe i mean theoretically yeah. if i mean i mean theoretically you should be driving at 30 anyway coming around there well, and should be, yeah. 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 Just, yeah. you know yeah. to come around there and see the flashing light and time to stop yeah. that's the only yeah. thing least. but that's but the direction that someone came around literally and went past all of the buses and it was a person in town who works for a Throwing one in the class here, but works for a company that had it. Their car was wrapped in their name, and and what when was I phoned, their name? <laughs> <laughs> I said, right? And we and I phoned and said, "This is the person that was driving the car, and their name is on their car." And I saw them in their car, and they were like, "Well, unless you really get a video of it." So that wasn't very helpful. So I'm not sure what else to do. Mm. And they came from that direction. I think visibility is the biggest issue. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Council, any further comments or questions? Well, I have a question for administration really uh, before anything else. I think for myself, this is one of those issues where I know this has been brought up in the past between uh, uh, the PAC, the school, and uh, former administration. I guess to our interim CAO uh, procedurally, uh, what's our best process? Because I absolutely agree that there's a problem. So I like, I mean, is this something that's on the books for the town still that we just need to execute on or does it need will of council? If I could uh, serve through you to the members of the committee, uh, actually 5.1 is going to be an opportunity to have a bit of a discussion on that. And uh, we are, uh, we are not just recognizing the importance of this. We are here and, and prepared to present a, a possible solution or solutions for the consideration of council in the future meeting. We also think it would be helpful if we had and something that is mentioned in your notes of sort of having a race section or a speed bump section that might be as helpful, like you said beforehand, to remind you that that light is there and, and to put that into a place so that we could slow the people down on that street. Mm -hmm. Councillor Magoon, Councillor LaBerge. Um, so this presupposes this 85 grand coming from the ATE reserve. How, what's the, how much in there? If we could, sir, we will get to that when we get to 5-1. Okay. If that's acceptable. Yep. Um, Matt is with us and he'll be able to speak to that. Okay. He was Thanks. investigating what's available. Okay. Councillor Taylor. I'm not quite understanding the second part of the proposal. Just to move something from some place to another place. So there's there's sort of two things. When we talked to Winston and Matt, we talked about our the direct one that's right in front of our school and the possibility of putting the overhang. We also suggested that it might also be helpful for us to move the crosswalk that is currently on Mountain Street to be on the west side of Ristler and not on the east side of Ristler. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 
Mulling, and then it, yeah. where it turns it to Rissler, it's actually on the uh, yeah. So Mulling and it's Fairfax, sorry, yeah. Fairfax. Mulling, Fairfax, and Mount. Now yeah. a crosswalk sign on the other side of the street. They yes. want to break from that side of the street. We want to move to the west side. side. Right. And it's got to be on this side of the street. Because... Well, then it's on the same side as the school. So then it saves us crossing down, having kids cross at the at as, a lot of us. As, as well. people are coming and going into the school, like in the morning and after school, there's a lot of traffic turning yes. west on Mountain Street. So with having the crosswalks there, we just think it would be best for that to happen. Like for it to be on the west side. But in yeah. our wish list, it's the one in front of the school though. Yes. We really need to focus on right now. Yeah. There was also talks of having um, the bus lane <clears throat> pull into the field that's kind of in front of the school there as well. And yeah, I didn't see it in the direction request either. So yeah, there's been different scenarios we've discussed. Right? <laughs> I see no Thank you, sir, through you to the members of the committee. Uh, administration, when we get to 5-1, I believe we have a bit more detail in terms of some mapping, and, and I think they even are going to kind of walk us through the area through Google Earth, so that will help us to better understand just what we are discussing here. And I think it is fair to say that administratively, we, I think we're mostly in agreement with what the parent council is bringing forward, and so we'll be able to speak to that and get a little more detail here when we get to the next agenda. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just in short, thanks for your patience. Uh, and I, I know it's just one of those things where it's back and forth transitioning between multiple staff. It's thank you. <laughs> thank you for all listening to us. Thank you, Councillor. I'm good. Council. Okay, seeing nothing further from the council. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. If you guys want to hang out for our first uh, action item this afternoon, I'm going to go to a different discussion, meeting. But, <laughs> well, I'm, for sure, that. I'm sure you'll be informed of uh, <laughs> yeah. council's discussion. Thank you so much. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. When is the next advisory? Um, it is maybe, I want to say, 18th. Is that a Tuesday? Can I have to look at my calendar? Yes. Mid May is the next one, yeah. So Thank you. we'll look forward to that. Seventeenth is the two. Is the two? Oh, it's the seventeenth. I think. Is that right? Yeah. Right. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Sixteen. Yeah. Okay. That brings us to uh, reports from administration. Five point one: Gerard Redmond Community Catholic School crosswalk safety MD two two three four. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are on page uh, three of your agenda package, and I'm actually going to ask uh, our director of protective services, our fire chief, to take us through this item. Mac, are you with us? Hello. There he is. Hi, Hello. Mac. I, I need to do a volume check. Is, is my mic working properly? We can hear you. If you can turn it up, that would probably help. Uh, that's a good question. Okay. On this archaic uh, microphone I have, I might not be able to. I'll just speak louder. <coughs> if that works. Yep, you're good. Okay, well, thank you, ICO Hanlon, uh, through the chair to all of uh, committee. Uh, this report that's before you is to address a long standing uh, concern for crosswalk safety at the Father Gerard uh, Redmond School. As we heard from the delegation uh, just, just now, uh, this has been a matter of concern for a couple of years now, actually probably about three years. Uh, both Mr. Rousseau and myself uh, visited the site recently to gain a better understanding of the area and their concerns and to gauge the severity of the safety concerns in preparation for today. It needs to be noted though that uh, proper signage is in place. Uh, speed restrictions are in the school zone there. There is existing flashing lights it, at the intersection of concern. Uh, and there is enforcement in place, both the RCMP, our bylaw officers, as well as the automatic traffic enforcement, that, that is one of the zones that they address. So there is, there is a presence there every, every school day, uh, but there are several other schools that they also have to patrol. Um, the lights at the intersection of Fairfax, um, Malign, Malign, not sure how to pronounce that, and Mountain would be better positioned if they were relocated to the south crosswalk. Uh, this would serve to increase visibility of the lights themselves 
as well as to encourage pedestrian traffic to the correct side of Maline Drive, reducing the need for uh, the majority of the students uh, to cross on the crosswalk directly in front of the school. Uh, so that's a big safety uh, matter right there. In addition, uh, administration really recommends that the, the installation of the flashing crosswalk signage at the crosswalk in front of the school adjacent to the parking lot. And that would be a cantilevered sign like we have at uh, all the other schools in town where they have elementary students. At both locations, we recommend wrapping the posts with high visibility reflective coloring uh, to indicate to the drivers in the area the, lo the actual location of the crosswalks. Um, at that location, they have um, topography working against them as well. When you're approaching the school, you're actually coming uh, downhill. And you, anybody that's uh, in front of the legally parked vehicles at that crosswalk are not visible to the drivers. So it's, it's very important that eventually we get some sort of uh, flashing uh, LED lights to indicate that crosswalk. Uh, so as I said, the enforcement practices are currently in place in all school zones, including Father Redmond School. And uh, we really want to take a phased approach uh, with engineered solutions, some traffic pacifying measures, and some signage changes could be implemented, implemented with limited costs right now. Uh, the traffic pacifying measures could be planned for in the future, uh, in the 2023 operating projects, and the uh, relocation of the crosswalk uh, sign at Mountain and Maline could be done at a minimal cost in 2022. Um, the changes to road elevations and that uh, cantilevered LED sign, we'd have to plan for that in future budget. Um, so for the benefit of the committee, we do have uh, the ability to walk walk you through with Google Earth. If Winston, you're there, can we can we pull that up for the benefit of committee? Sure. Thanks, Chief. Just get Debbie to share her screen. So Debbie will drive and I will speak. Um, so thank you through to the chair, the chair to all of the committee. Um, what with your facing west on Mountain Street with this view, um, the delegation has just told you about the existing lighting, the flashing lights. So these are the ones with a little hand where Debbie is showing us right now. And this is where the, the, the kids cross. So two things. One, as you can see, the three on your right hand side of the screen often conceals the flashing light. Two, the lights are far too short. Uh, so it is, is not really conspicuous for the unassuming motorists, though the speed limit down there would show that you should be reducing. Um, at that point, um, the delegation has just recommended, and we were out on site with the delegation, that if you take that uh, zebra crossing or pedestrian crossing, and you shift it further west, you're going to the other side of the, 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 the intersection, just as that Ada was showing right now. What that does, it actually, and, and Chief, uh, the fire chief has just told us that there's a topography elevation difference between where the existing sign or, or the flashing lights are to where that median and the connection of the proposed walkthrough would be. So if we just stand still at this point, you'll see that where the arrow is, we're going to take the existing zebra crossing and bring it to the new location as shown on your screen. That will help the students to stay on the same side of the school. It will give them a better refuge from trying to cross twice. And then as we move up into Marine Drive, so I would just want to add one thing in case council may wonder if we do shift this post to the west as indicated, those are all solar illuminated um, signage. So there is no underground conduiting that needs to be either trenched or trenchlessly done. You basically have to abandon the two paths on which the two flashing lights are positioned, take it west and then basically pour two new pads. That, that would be the only cost. And of course, 
having to black out those existing zebra crossings and create your new crossing. Now, where the hand is and the arrow is showing, you'll see the elevation difference. Though with the eye, it is not possible to see, but there's quite a difference when you drive that road coming from the west going east or the reverse. So that is that change that is proposed. When you proceed up Moline Drive, approaching, you'll see that we have a slight incli incline to the street. You will notice that on the right-hand side of the screen, there's limited if to no pedestrian refuge or sidewalk, so to speak. And the left-hand side does give you a sidewalk that makes it safer in winter and summer for kids and parents and strollers to go on the left-hand side of the road. As we pass a little further up the street, you'll see a sign that will say slow down and it's a 30 kilometer sign. If you're doing 31 kilometers, it will flash at you. Even with a vehicle stationed there, it is high enough to show forth that you're off too fast. Um, well, there is an opportunity to, to raise those slightly, the signage, with the wrapping of that pole, as the chief just indicated, would be part of the solution. What we're seeking to do to have all the poles wrapped with a reflective um, yellow or orange um, warning is to have it more conspicuous for the driver that may not be adhering to situational awareness being in a school zone. So as we move further up Moline Drive, you will see that we are still shy of sidewalk on the right hand side. It makes it very hard for kids to stay. They're actually walking in the street. <laughs> If, if I may put it that way. Um, moving further ahead past that speed sign, you're coming to the existing crossing. And as the delegation quite rightly pointed out, that little SUV parked there is, is one of the residents and they quite rightly are parking where they should be parking in front of their home. But you have very little pedestrian refuge for a kid that has gotten off that curb and wanting to cross. By the time he or she crosses, they're likely in the path of an oncoming vehicle. So we, what we're suggesting at this point is to, to, to the left of the street is to have a vertical post that will go with a cantilever across midway the street that would have a face on both ends of a flashing light as well as a sign pedestrian crossing and anything that would cause people to realize that you are approaching a, a crossing or a zebra crossing or a pedestrian crossing. The reason why cantilever for two reasons or more, the primary reason is that we have no space or limited space on the resident side on the opposite side of that road. At the same time, we don't want to limit the residents with further infrastructure on their sidewalk. We have sufficient on the uh, Gerard Redman side to put that cantilevered flashing light. So that's the improvement we seek to do there. Um, if Debbie, if you could just scroll back to the green space towards the school, and I just want to show the committee, if we go to the left, yep, yep, no, yep, there we go. So as, as the committee views where these trees are, the two large trees, we do have an option, and this is a future consideration, where we could, now there is a fire hydrant somewhere close by as well. We could have a, a bus lay-by or a bus a cut, a sort of turning lane, if I may call it that way, so that the bus completely is off the road and I'll still allow um, students to, to cross in a safe way. That way we're opening up the road for pedestrians to do so safely, but that's a future consideration. And that of course is gonna mean a lot of dirt work and it's not sort of recommended right now. Um, going back towards the crosswalk, Debbie, as we go further up Moline Drive, I just want to show the committee that distance from the crosswalk to where you start taking the turn, I believe it was Councillor House that asked the question, that is about 56.4 meters to the crosswalk back. That's 185 feet to convert it to Imperial. So. 56 meters would give you enough time to respond. However, um, if you go further down the lane, uh, Debbie, if you just want to orient, it, go to the bend, and you'll see towards that green, there's a sign right there by the green box above, and that's a 30 kilometer sign, a flashing sign. So any approaching vehicles from that end, east to west, will be warned that they are doing above 30, 
So that will cause them to slow down. You hit the curve, the curve where you're not able to accelerate. The lights are flashing as over the cantilever, and that will give you enough time to say that they can slow down. So coming around that bend, you're at 30, hopefully. You'll see the lights flashing, and you've got enough response time if you're doing 30 plus, which you should not be doing in the first place. But that's just to help oncoming traffic, and especially in winter, when that crosswalk is no longer visible and covered with snow and ice, potentially. Um, the other, finally, just to, to, as we face the crosswalk, and Debbie, if you wanted to go a little closer to that crosswalk, one solution that we could look at is to have a, a speed calming mechanism right at the point where Debbie's um, mouse is and have it as a trapezoidal raised pavement color-coded to be red, and then that is your crosswalk in conjunction with the overhead cantilevered flashing lights. That would be for the next phase. So what administration has done is, is that we looked at, this is an unsafe situation. It is uh, been long coming, and we are aware of this. To mitigate and to address the main concerns and to get it safer is to do as the chief has just outlined in his recommendation that we, we move on the mountain street side, the lights to the west, repaint the crosswalk, put on conspicuous stickers and reflective uh, membrane on the poles and raise some of the signs to be more conspicuous. And then the overhead cantilevered signs. And that's basically the scope that will be about 85,000. Now that 85,000 is rounded up it's probably around 78,000, but with escalation and where supply chain things are going these days, we estimated 85,000 to be sufficient should we undertake the works this year, which is still very possible based on the team within infrastructure that have viewed the scope of work and talked to the suppliers as well. So with that, I'll hand it back to the chair and any questions be open to that. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you, Mr. Rizzo. If we could leave that up in case the uh, committee wants to refer to that when they question us. But administration uh, is asking committee to direct administration to bring back to regular meeting of council May 3rd, 2022 for council's consideration to add lighted crosswalk infrastructure to the Father Gerard Redmond Community Catholic School to the 2022 capital plan and that the funding of $85,000 be uh, taken from the ATE reserve fund. And with that, if uh, committee has any questions, uh, we'll, we'll be pleased to answer those. Thank you, Chief Bodrop and Mr. Russo, Mayor Michaels and then Councilman Lagoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, gentlemen, uh, great presentation. Uh, in principle, I support this a lot. There's one potential upgrade that I see that may be of value. My question to administration, the moving the lights on Mountain Street from the east side to the west side, uh, what would it cost to upgrade those lights? Because that seems like old technology. The newer lights are, for lack of a better term, really flashy and they grab your attention. These old school type lights, you don't really see well uh, when it's sunny. I drive there often. Uh, it's not something that we, we, we have been putting in our community recently. So if we wanted to upgrade those, since we're going to be going in on the ground, installing new ones, what would it cost to upgrade those to something more uh, technologically friendly for 2022? I will defer to Mr. Russo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chief, and through to the committee, to Mayor Michaels. You're probably looking at, if you're wanting to say, if I understand your question correctly, we remove the existing lights, we don't repurpose them, and we put in more technologically improved lighting. You're probably looking at about a touch of between 38,000 to 50,000. That's what you'll be looking at. Okay, thank you for that. Thank Michaels, you. Councillor Magoon, and then Councillor Barish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, thank you very much. That was a really thorough presentation. My question comes on page two of three of the report, just above the blue bar that says implications for decision. Um, 
And really it's a procedural question that I just need to make sure I understand. So it says relocation of the crosswalk sign at Mountain and Moline could be done at minimal costs in 2022, okay? Changes to road elevations or the addition of LED warning lights would require a project plan uh, and budget for 2023. Those LED warning lights, are you talking about the, uh, the LED warning lights, the cantilever that would go near to the school or are we talking over Mountain Street itself? Uh, through the chair to answer that question, uh, Councillor, uh, I was under the impression that, that the um, cantilevered lights at the main crosswalk would be next year, uh, but that may have been a miscommunication between Mr. Russo and myself. Well, if, if I could clarify, Mr. Chair, what my major concern is, basically the, the question that I was trying to, to figure out with the report was, um, the folks from Gerard said, you know, their number one concern was the crosswalk right, right in front of the school. With the project plan in front of us, does that get them the overhead light at the school in 2022? If I may, through the chair, uh, thank you, Chief. Um, Councillor Magoon, you are correct that the cantilevered uh, uh, solution is meant to be for 2022 at the Gerard Redmond crosswalk, the one we're looking at right now. Perfect. Thanks for the clarification. That's, uh, yeah, that wraps it up for me. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Councillor Magoon, Councillor LaBerge, and then there might be. Yeah, that's my reserve level question now then is, is where is that AT reserve at? Uh, Matt, do you, can you uh, give us an idea in our discussions with finance what the balance of the AT budget is, or excuse me, the AT reserve is? Uh, thank you very much, uh, through the chair, to uh, answer your counselor the better. The AT reserve balance currently sits at 680325 and 59 cents. Thank you. Councillor Bears and Michaels. Thank and you, Mr. Chair. Um, administ I guess my question for administration, um, any uh, insights or um, I guess information on perhaps painting the new crosswalks with reflective paint? Uh, it's something that I've heard in the community that if we're gonna paint, uh, why not use reflective paint that works in the evenings? Any comments or thoughts on that? Uh, through the chair, uh, that is not a bad idea. Uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, the, the, for the majority of the school year, uh, during school zone times, uh, we are in darkness or semi-darkness. Uh, so reflective paint does make sense, but also those same school years, probably 50% of that, they, there is snow cover on the ground. So it limits the reflectivity, but uh, Mr. Rousseau is more of the roads expert, so I'll defer to him. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak again and to council and to all of the committee. Um, so in our quotation, when we looked at the overhead uh, flashing signs, we also looked at putting down a thermal plastic, which a crosswalk paint that will have the reflective pebbles in it as well. So what that does too, it does reflect when there's not too much snow on there. Two, it is also longer living as you go over with plows. And you've got about, you know, based on my experience, you got to, you get about seven to eight years out of that uh, sort of crosswalk um, paint that we suppose that we're using in terms of the thermoplastic. To give you an idea what the thermoplastic is, it is basically the striping that uh, Alberta Transportation uses on most of their highways uh, these days. So they're doing it in a phased approach. So it costs a bit more, but it does last longer and it does have the qualities that Mayor Michaels referred to. So that's included in our quotation. Hello, Mayor Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that answer. That's great. I'm assuming that's only for Moline, a road for Mountain Street. If we're switching the, the crosswalk to the west side, that would be normal paint. And then it would, or, or is that also going to be the new re reflective plastic uh, material that you uh, spoke to? If, if I may, Mr. Chair, just to answer Mayor Michaels, correct, it would be the thermal plastic. That was one quotation my team obtained. So 
if the prices hold, as we know, we're in, a, in, in sort of escalation time of pricing because of supply chain, but we will be going aiming for the thermoplastic at a minimum. That helps us with uh, maintenance and annual line striping. If we don't have to do this for five to seven years and counting, it's better for the maintenance team to focus on other areas where we don't get to typically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Michaels, Councillor Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So based on what I've heard so far and the, the, all the thought that's gone into this project, I'd like to move the Community Direct Administration to bring back to a regular meeting of Council May 3rd, 2022. For council's consideration to add Lego crosswalk infrastructure at the Gerard Regent Community Catholic School to the 2022 capital budget and that the funding of $85,000 be from the AT Reserve Fund. Can I can speak to it. Yep. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, the AT Reserve Fund, this is exactly what this fund is for, is for safety. Um, you know, it has been uh, an ongoing issue, obviously, in this, in this area. And the fact that this is the last school in our community that does have. Uh, this, well, I shouldn't say that, our Harry College doesn't have that, or, but uh, based on the fact that there is some safety concerns there and, and based on the fact that to the, the thoroughness of the report, um, you know, uh, I'm in favor of this. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross, I see you. Thank you, sir. And, and just, uh, I would like to add that uh, if council, or excuse me, if the committee were to uh, take a look at this May 3rd, it would be our intention to bring as an option, the higher visibility lighting as a possible option. We'll try to get an estimate on that for Mountain Street to see if that's something that council may wish to fund as well on top of this. I will reiterate, and I think all council is aware, or all community is aware of this, excuse me, and that is that we are dealing with something that's timely. So we would wanna move on this very quickly so we could be undertaking this work during the summer break. Is often when we want to be working around school zones as when the students aren't here and when we can get in and do some of this work that's going to be necessary to have this installed for the fall and the mm -hmm. return to school. Um, thank you. Thank you, ICO now, Councillor Race, and then Councillor Lagoon. Thank you, sir. I have a comment and also a question. My comment or in support of um, Councillor Hans's motion. I think back in 2018-2019, the fire hall asked for Eighty-seven thousand dollars to put crosswalk or um, overhead lights and flashing lights in at the fire hall to protect the equipment, protect the firefighters when they were responding to a call. And I have no issue at all spending that same amount of money to protect our children, our teachers, and volunteers, um, including up this lighting. And I'll go back and queue for my question, sir. If there's more. Okay. Councillor Magoon and then Councillor Reese. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm fully in support of the, the direction and I appreciate it being put forward. I would also just like to take a moment to uh, to express my appreciation to administration. Um, I think it was an excellent report and the fact that it was done in collaboration with, uh, you know, a really well planned out and thought out um, presentation from members of our community and public. I think it was just, a, a you know, it was a, a nice combination. I think it really sets up the case very clearly clearly for the community on why this is a, an important project. So thanks for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, to administration, the company that does the reflective painting, the crosswalks in St. Albert and Spruce Grove, they're the same company that we employ to come here every year and do our white crosswalks. And they also have the patent on that on reflective painting. So, are those the people that um, Winston was referencing? If I could, Winston, I'm not sure if you heard count, uh, Councillor Race's question. Um, the uh, the company that we currently use for our, our our line painting and our sidewalk painting, is that the same company that has this technology we're speaking of for these school zone crossings? Through to the chair, to, to all of the committee, and specifically to the question that ICAO Hanlon has just reiterated to me, the, the, the type of thermoplastic that we're talking about is not just proprietary to a certain line painting striping company. It is an off-the-shelf product that all line painting contractors can harness. It's just a slightly more in cost. So when we put out our bid, to, to do the work, we'll specify it's a thermoplastic with a beaded component to it, and then we'll get the pricing in. We don't have a, 
a specific contractor that we use. It so happened that over the last three years, I think, that we had the same contractor come through with the best price. So it is a market-related pro product, and we can specify it as to what we desire the product to be. Councillor Riggs, Councillor Taylor. Yeah, for this project too. And oh, by the way, I like the technology. Um, uh, I've seen that a few times. And this makes me feel like it's summer, so I like that too. <laughs> My question is that uh, there's an eight thousand five hundred dollar difference between the um, between the uh, quote and what you're asking for money. I don't mind that because that's kind of in the ten percent range. But you did mention that that was for supply chain issues, which leads me to believe that this quote, which is only 18 days old at $76,000, they could come back and ask for more. Is this quote, as long as we do this quote within 30 days, this is, this is what they get to charge, and that's it. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. And if I could add to that too, before your <coughs> answers, um, I, I, I didn't see the, re, the uh, reflective uh, sidewalk paint in there too, or I'm sorry, either. So is that included somewhere else? Is that additional to the full administration? Yeah. Okay. So through to the chair, to the rest of the committee, the reflective uh, thermoplastic should be and is included in the 85,000, the allowance that we were made was a recommendation by the supplier, not knowing, of course, exactly if council was going to go with a full scope or partial scope. So for argument's sake, that you may have, you could decide to say, let's leave mountain to 2023 and we only do the marine improvements. And so because of the economy of scales changing, the supplier has given us a scalable amount uh, of 85,000. Now. Will that change between now and May the 3rd and when the implementation, there is that likelihood things are changing by the day. But my team will go back after this evening and try and pin down that price. And if there's gonna be a marginal difference compared to what we indicated tonight, to what comes back on May the 3rd, we will reflect that accordingly. So Taylor. Well, I'm, I'm confused. This says post valid for 30 days. What's that mean then? To, to admin, did you did you hear that? I did not. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor Taylor said that he noted on the quote that it says it's valid for thirty days. So he's just wondering if they can be held with that. Wonder, wondering what that means. So through to the chair to um, Councillor Taylor. Yes, that the, the quote is held for 30 days. That's what they can guarantee us the cost would be. By the time that, uh, so if we give them the yes tomorrow, that number stays. But because May the 3rd would be greater than 30 days, that means there could be an escalation just to help council a little bit. And, and that just today we've heard on certain elements in terms of cost. Some folks in terms of steel prices have gone up. And we've seen 75 to 80% change in pricing that one of the suppliers just shared with us today. Now, not to, 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 to react to every bit that we hear, but it is a reality in the system this year that we will see prices escalate. But we are going to pin the price down. We will say that we'll likely get a decision on May the 3rd that could they fix their price. And if that's the case, and it's not more, we will advise council as well. But I'm pretty confident that the price should not swing at greater than 85 based on the extra cushion that's already in there unless something really happens in the market. But I am doubtful based on the conversations we had with the supplier, but we will double check for May the 3rd. Just a point of order to correct. Um, May 3rd is within the 30 days of the quote. The date of the quote is April 8th. Right. Uh, so just through to the chair, we will check that Councillor Taylor to make sure that everything holds. Um, I'm seeing quotes these days that they're saying they will not guarantee anything above seven days, even though that quote says 30 days. So we will hold them to it. That's what we typically do. And we just want to make sure that um, we double check with them because things are changing by the day as we speak. Thank you. 
Uh, just before I move on, I just want to verify too. I, I'm sure I'm sure I heard you say it, but I believe you said the eighty-five thousand that's budgeted is sufficient to cover the quote and the reflective painting. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mitty, is there anything further? Any other questions? If not, we have a motion. <coughs> you could see the motion. Thank you. Councillor Haas has moved the committee direct administration to bring back to a regular meeting of Council May 3rd, 2022, for Council's consideration to add lighted crosswalk infrastructure at the Gerard Redmond Community Catholic School to the 2022 capital plan and that the funding $85,000 be from the ATE reserve fund. Sorry, sir. I am just wondering if council may consider this comes back for action May 3rd. And I'm wondering if council might allow us to take the 85,000 out and simply bring you options. I mentioned that there may be some additional options that may take us over that 85,000 amount. This will still be ultimately decided by council. And when I said, maybe just to clarify, we had mentioned the possibility of maybe changing out the light standards on mountain to something that's the newer technology, higher visibility and flashing more of those had costs associated. Council will be determining the actual costs May 3rd. And I would just, I would, I would ask council to consider not tying us to an $85,000 amount here if one of those options might exceed 85,000. And where I'm suggesting the 85,000 could be exceeded is the idea of rather than relocating the two standards on mountain, we might end up with two new ones on mountain. That would still be one of the options, but. Thank you for the suggestion, RCA O'Hamlin. So committee, there's a suggestion from administration to remove the dollar value from the proposed motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know I spoke to that one possible addition at first, but my preference is if the will of council is committed to this, we we this doesn't mean we're voting for it. This is saying the committee is at this moment leaning towards and, and looking to debate and approve this. And if there's new information from administration that they want to add into the report that we want to consider, then the will of council could prevail that day. But without that info today, it's hard to unless we want to go through that discussion and know and give parameters, I, I'm kind of going against what I, I, I want to look at, but I think it could be delivered in other means. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to play out how this conversation is going to look like in the next half an hour, if we start changing and bring it, I appreciate the flexibility, but this is, this is a consensus of council that we're happy with any, any new information that could be added to me, you know, uh, outside of, uh, of, the specific direction, but that's just my thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Michaels. Councilor Taylor. My thought, well, I'm not opposed to the change, but my thought is that we've got the parent advisory committee, we've got administration, they've come to us, they've given us a report on some bigger changes here that they always probably support. Now we're going to do uh, extra to those changes that haven't really been well thought through between uh, different groups in town. We could make this the most safest spot in the whole town, but there might be other parts of the town where that safety money could be better spent than at that particular corner. Truly, administration would like the ability to go back and look at the other safety initiatives around the town to see where that money could be well spent rather than just uh, wing it in this meeting without any sort of uh, detailed uh, cost to estimates or detailed uh, safety uh, analysis. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. So committee, we do have a proposed motion. So if there is a will to change the motion, I'd look to committee member to uh, voice that. If not, we'll call to question. Councillor Magoon. Only the question that I'll pose is because it'll impact how I vote. Uh, question for administration, based on what the mayor had suggested, I would hope administration could come back with a high level, you know, uh, expression of what that upgraded light system might cost. So I could consider that on May the third. Uh, is that the intention of administration if this uh, if this direction were to pass? Sir, through you to the members of the committee. Yes, uh, assuming that we could get a a strong estimate on the cost of those two standards, that would be presented as an option for the 
consideration of the council on May 3rd. Thank you. Councilor Maguna, committee, anything further before we call to question? Okay, seeing nothing, it's still the same exact proposed motion that was put forward by Councilor Haas. Uh, I'm not going to read it again. I already read it. It's quite long. It hasn't changed. Uh, committee, all those in favor? It's carried unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Anything further before we move on to our next item? Councilor Grace? Thank you, sir. So, should the old lights be removed, what happens to them? Are they utilized somewhere else in town? Or solve them, or what do we do? I see O'Hanlon. I'm not sure if you're prepared at this point to respond to that since it just came out of the discussion. I so based on my practice with other communities, and, and Winston can certainly speak to this if he wishes. But we would typically hold on to these and look to utilize those appropriately and safely in another location in town. The technology remains viable in the correct in the correct application of the correct location. Councilor Reese, maybe anything further before we move on? Mr. Russo? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Chair. Just to add to ICL Hanlon's comment, we do have similar posts like that where we are managing our traffic signaling. So if anything gets run over, we could repurpose that elsewhere in the town. So it would not be obsolete or rust away in our public works yard. So it can be repurposed even if we do not reposition them to the location proposed in tonight's report. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Any Councillor Ross? Uh, just a quick question about in where they're at currently on Mountain Street with that tree in the way. Is that going to be dealt with? Because I could see it clearly in the in the picture there that one of the the posts is covered up by the tree. So I guess in the meantime, you know, it's going to be there still until we move them. Uh, if that can be dealt with, uh, I think that would help the, the safety of that area as well. So just just a question to administration. Sir, through you to uh, Member Haas and to, to all, of, all of the committee, um, the land use bylaw does anticipate, does envision sight line protection at all intersections. And so we would have to take a look at the possibility, and I just want to simply say only the possibility at this time of enforcement of that action. Uh, at that at this location, I, I will share that uh, anytime we try to undertake something like this, we're going to get shown 98 other locations in the town where very similar things are in play, and so that's the difficulty when we get in here. But we do have sight line regulations on private property, and that speaks to vegetation, landscaping, and fences at these sight lines. So we can take a look at that here and see if that's something that needs to be implemented or enforced here to ensure public safety. Anything further? Okay. Um, just before we move <coughs> on to uh, 5.2, I, I did I had a question. It's, um, it's regarding the, the audio. Is it possible to get audio from this television as well as that one? This one seems to be the only one that's uh, that's outputting any audio. And, uh, mostly for uh, consideration of Councillor Briggs. Oh, we're at 100 down here, so we will have to check that. Um, it didn't sound like we were getting any audio from this one. It no, it's it just that one. Okay. okay, that will bring us to 5.2 short term rental bylaw number 1162. I see you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the members of the committee. We are on page nine of your agenda package. And uh, as the members will recall, the uh, short term rental bylaw, that uh, is bylaw 1162, has had first reading and proceeded through the public hearing process. Uh, after that public hearing process, there was a tremendous amount of input and uh, follow up, or input from the public and follow up from the planning and development staff, which is being brought back for the consideration of the committee at this time. And I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Walker to take us through this, uh, commencing on page uh, 9. 
Oh, you're, uh, you're muted, uh, Lorraine. Thank you, CAO Hanlon, through to Council. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Yeah, so just to reiterate what CAO Hanlon just said is that after the public hearing was held on March 15th, Council heard that most operators and hosts that were present were not opposed to a bylaw regulating short-term rentals within our community. However, they did express some common key concerns. After the public hearing and during the regular meeting, Council made some motions that have been addressed within the report tonight. Um, I'll go in to just highlight them. Uh, Council had wanted to reinstate the non-principal residents into the short-term rentals bylaw and the requirement for a local property manager be designated that has timely access to the premises and authority to make decisions uh, to the premises as well as rental agreement at all times. This will create a two-tiered license application uh, for business license, which would be for the uh, persons who live in their home as well as the persons who rent out their entire home. The report reflects the cost breakdown, however, uh, in the report, should Council wish to increase the fee for the non-principal residents, administration is recommending a yearly fee of $560, as opposed to $285 for out-of-town residents. Uh, the second item was um, Council heard that the requirement for hardwire, smoke, and carbon monoxide alarms were an inconvenience and time-consuming and costly to obtain an electrician. The purpose is to provide common signaling so that the activation of one alarm causes all alarms to sound at all levels in the house. It was reiterated by the fire chief that smoke and carbon monoxide alarms must be interconnected as per the Alberta <laughs> Building Code. Further to research, the Alberta Building Code does now accept products and systems that are on the market as alternatives to hard wiring which can be installed by the homeowners with a Bluetooth adapter or wireless models and are, of course, a less cost. The third item uh, was with regards to bed and breakfast. Uh, just to reiterate that bed and breakfasts are not a standalone bylaw. They are already included within the land use bylaw 1088. The difference is that the length of accommodation and can only be operated by the principal residents. These were the original, this like the bed and breakfast originally um, were for a primary dwelling offering tourist accommodation with a meal. Tourist accommodation has evolved over time and we know that bed and breakfasts are also advertised on short term rental platforms. Administration is recommending that bed and breakfasts be merged with short term rentals for principal residents only. Parking was a concern. Uh, currently, the land use bylaw requires one off-street parking stall per guest room. To help alleviate parking limitations expressed by existing operators and hosts, administration is recommending one off-street parking stall per two guest rooms. As it relates to non-principal residence parking, this is regulated through the traffic bylaw 1023. Administration is recommending that the operator hosts do everything possible to provide designated off-street parking stalls for their guests. If this cannot be achieved, then they, and they use street parking, they must be aware of any parking restrictions or they could be issued a, tick, a fence ticket or towed. The last item was the identification sign or sticker on the exterior of an accommodation. Should council wish to require this still, um, administration recommends a standard customized sticker that the town would produce and provide to the operators of the host as part of their approved business license package. This can create consistency and fairness for all operators and hosts. And within the report, there are just some samples um, and that can be discussed further. So therefore this evening administration is recommending that committee agree to these recommended amendments and direct administration to bring bylaw number 1162 forward to the regular meeting of council on May 17th to receive second reading as amended and give third and final reading at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Uh, committee, are there any comments, questions, motions? Councillor Haas, Councillor Lamere. 
Yeah, I just have a question to, <clears throat> I guess this would go to fire chief, um, but in regards to the fire alarms, smoke detectors, um, that's uh, this requirement, there's no limitation on the age of house, because um, that was a discussion, I think last time we talked about the age of the home. Um, and can you speak to that? Yes, uh, and to be uh, through the chair to answer that question. Uh, to be clear, in a residential home, uh, the age of the house does determine um, whether you need to have interconnected um, smoke detectors or smoke alarms. Uh, as soon as you create a rental property or a short-term rental property or a hotel type situation, it is the law, it's in the code, the building code that they have to have interconnected. There is the option of using Bluetooth or wireless uh, detectors that are interconnected. And it comes at a substantial less cost than hardwiring an older home. Uh, in newer homes, it, it's a requirement to have them interconnected already. So uh, it's a non-issue if they're a rel relatively new building. If they're an older building that has been in existence for a while, they are still required to have that interconnectability because they are renting that property out. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Haas, Councillor LaMarche, and then Councillor Taylor. Um, thanks. Uh, my question, page three of five, uh, where it's talking about the parking. So we're gonna, we're gonna require um, a parking stall for every two rooms if it's in your personal residence. <clears throat> but if it's not, then we're not gonna require any offsite parking. Is that what this says? Registration. Yes, thank you through chair to rest of council. That is correct. And that is because the requirement for a home-based business for a residential home at the principal residence is the off-street parking stall. So it's attached to the, the home business application. Councilor Barish, did you want to follow up? Sure. I mean, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't make sense. But if it if that's why you did it, it would seem to me that if you're going to do it to one category of this uh, of this business community, you do it to the ball. Um, I mean, if 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 people visiting, we want to get them off the street. We've got to require that there's off street parking. Seems to me. Do you want a motion to amend or anything? Or I'm I'm curious. I mean, does that in the minds of others is that an issue? Not an no, issue. Uh, okay, so I have Councillor Taylor in queue, but I've this seems to have raised a a side discussion. So um, maybe we'll we'll stay on the on the topic of the uh, uh, offsite parking. Uh, in terms of non-principal residents until that's resolved, if that's okay. So I'm going to go Councillor Taylor, Councillor Magoon, and then Mayor Michaels. Yeah. To totally agree. Not fair. Both should have off-street parking. However, if you actually read the bylaw, bylaw doesn't separate it out. The actual bylaw that we've been given doesn't separate it out for principal or non-principal residents. It says that regardless of which one it is, provision of one off street parking space per two guest rooms is required. And I read this like three times. I don't see how it's separated. So I'm not sure how the comments in the um, package correlate to the comments in the actual bylaw that we've been given because I don't see a separation. That's kind of a question. Yeah, so can we go to administration to see if we can get some additional clarity on that? I see you, Hamlin. Uh, sir, through you to the members of the uh, committee of the whole, and Miss Walker can speak to this as well. Um, I believe what you have attached to today's package being bylaw number 1162 is the bylaw that received first reading. And so we are polling 
and asking council to speak to these possible changes that will be included and incorporated into. So we haven't incorporated everything we're proposing. We're waiting for the direction of, of council on this matter when it comes back to council. Ms. Walker, is that correct? Thank you, CEO Hamlin. That is correct. Uh, I did, however, highlight in red this, the um, changes that council has uh, asked for. And so I have added that now that this should say principal residence only provisions of one. So that should be separated if, if we move ahead with these amendments, correct. And if I might, if I may, just to, um, to let council know that under the land use bylaw, we have to regulate land use. And in, in that, when we are issuing a home-based business, we have to regulate parking. And that is why we are required to have those off-street parking stalls. And the short-term rentals, non-principal residents are not under the land use bylaw. They're going to be their own separate bylaw. And we know that people will park on the street, but at their risk, um, if they adhere to all the parking restrictions, um, then you know hopefully they're fine if they move their vehicle within 72 hours, because we know that happens now. Um, so, but we don't want to open it up for everyone because then we could end up with some real issues in some neighborhoods and cause some, some, um, some situations where there is going to be increased traffic and congestion. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Um, just before we move on to Councilor McGoon and Councilor Michaels, I, I'm still unclear on that because like Councilor Taylor says, the bylaw still says provision of one off-street parking space per two guest rooms is required. And it doesn't make any differentiation between residential, uh, sorry, non-residential and residential. So I, I understand that it's a requirement of the of the uh, home-based business bylaw, so that's fine. But the, the question was, you know, should it apply to uh, to a non-principal residence uh, short-term rental provider as well? And the way I read the bylaw, it applies to both. And I think that's what Councillor Taylor was saying too. However, this was without change. These amendments included. This was like CEO and Hamlin said. This was issued first reading, or sorry, at first reading, um, this bylaw was based on principal residence only. And that's what why item T refers to one, one off-street park install per two guest rooms, because that was based on principal residence only until we, we recently at the public hearing um, heard from council with the following motions that they want to now include the non-principal residents. So that would need to be updated as well in the bylaw to reflect that. Thank you. That, that might be on me. It was my understanding that all the motions that council made were reflected in this version of the bylaw. And that's what was in red. It doesn't say anything. Correct, and I missed that one. And that's why I reiterated that, yes, we would need to specify those and separate them in the bylaw. I apologize for missing that. No, we don't. So this is one Okay, uh, I'll go to Councillor Magoon and then Councillor Mayor Michaels. I'm good to withdraw right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Magoon, Mayor Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, ultimately, I think Section T, if there's a will of council to make it even on both sides that we'll leave it that way. Uh, and I, if there's consensus, I'll support uh, making it for non-primary uh, and primary residents, both would have the same parking um, restrictions uh, if that's the will, so uh, thank you. Mayor Michaels. I, I do have a follow-up, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, go ahead. So I, I guess my question to administration in thinking this through is, is part of the logic behind a differential between uh, one off street parking space per two guest rooms for non-principal principal residents, or sorry, for uh, principal residents and not having it right now for a non-principal. Is it the idea that, you know, most of these houses may have parking pads in front of the house. And so it's assumed that the guests are gonna utilize those because it's not the principal residence 
uh, of the people who are renting them out. Is that is that part of the logic there? Administration. Uh, thank you, through to chair, through to council. Not necessarily. Um, we do require in the land use bylaw that you must maintain two parking stalls for your residents if you live in the home, of course. And then we're recommending that you have one stall per guest rooms, um, per two guest rooms on your site, not including the garage or the street under your home occupation permit that you would be issued as well as your business license. Um, so no, like a, if you actually have a whole house, an entire house that you're renting, most likely if the residents aren't living there, most likely there's going to be additional parking in front of the, in the driveway. Um, so it might alleviate having to park on the street. Uh, but we know depending on how the short-term rentals are set up, whether people access them from the rear or the side of their home or what have you, will dictate where they want to park the car. Sometimes they park on the street, even if they do have a, a designated spot uh, on a parking pad or, or in the driveway. Um, does that answer your question, Councillor Magoon? Uh, I think, yes, to an extent. I guess a, a case study would help me understand it a little bit more. So if I may, uh, if I had, say, a five-bedroom home, uh, that I was renting out and it wasn't my principal residence uh, and it had a, a pad in front of the house. The pad really doesn't come into play. I take five bedrooms. I'm going to divide it, you know, essentially by two. Um, I don't know if I round up or not. I would assume I probably do. So am I going to need three off street parking stalls for that five bedroom house? No, you will. The bylaw only requires two for the dwelling at all times, whether you have five bedroom house or two bedroom house. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to go, sorry, before I go to the back committee, I'm going to go to ICAO now. I'm going to get something you'd like to add. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And possibly it's to, to come around and see if I can help member Magoon a bit here on, on this. And so, I believe from a planning and development perspective, when it's not the principal dwelling, there isn't the possibility of the operator, their children, and those two vehicles already expected to be parked there. And now we're adding additional parking to account for the rooms. Um, I believe that's the intent of administration here. And I, and I, see, I see Ms. Walker nodding her head. I, I think possibly just we should clarify though, Ms. Walker, is it correct that non-resident or residential that the maximum number of additional parking is two parking stalls? So we had the five bedroom discussion just a moment ago. So let's, well, let me make it clear. It, theoretically, if there was a six bed, a six bedroom house that was operated by a property manager, it would still only require two parking stalls, correct? Correct. Okay. So I, I think we would want the bylaw to state that it, it to a maximum of two or something to that effect. So it's not confusing unless it's desired to have the additional parking. Okay, committee, we're still going to stay on this for a bit, I believe. Councillor LaBerge. Yeah, I mean, my intent would be that we would need three parking stalls for a five bedroom house. I mean, uh, the, part of the problem is that these places can get to be inconvenient for neighbors. And I think everything we can do to make sure that this business that's being run in a residential neighborhood doesn't get into the neighbor's face. And so, I mean, if, 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 if we need parking per room, then I think there should be parking per room. Thank you, Councillor LaPierre. Committee, anything further on this before we switch gears? Councillor Taylor? Well, I get really confused because, like, it does say that in the bylaw, like, that we'd be given, but apparently this is not the final word of what we'd be given. There's some changes that aren't in here that we should have looked at before. Right? Like, there's the tax two per thing that's not in here. There's the two per 
Well, I like it the way it's written. No, I now. like it perfectly the way it's written. I don't want it to change. That's my point. But that's not what I'm here. So do I need to put a motion to, to make this the words that we were given stay for parking? Uh, the procedural questions are ICO handling because I'm a little bit confused too. <laughs> To, for, to me, this is the, what we're debating is what we have before us, not you know, what we should have been given. I, I don't thought. believe. Yeah. So, sir, through you to uh, to all the members of the committee, Miss Walker. In terms of clarification on the parking discussion, so uh, to all of to all of the committee, we are bringing forward proposed changes to the bylaw, and certainly when we come back to the bylaw on May third. I'm going to just ask that Ms. Walker bring it in a track changes format so we can clearly identify what changes between first reading and second reading. Um, and so we'll make sure that we capture the intent of, of council. And I apologize for any confusion here tonight on that. Um, what I do hear from council is a, a request or desire not to limit the amount of stalls. So again, theory, theoretically, a six bedroom house being operated by a property manager needs to have a minimum of three on-site parking stalls that can be utilized by guests. Um, and will the language, I'm, I, to, to uh, Councillor Taylor's comment, I don't believe we need a motion. We will make sure it's more clearly communicated to Council for May 3rd. Uh, yeah, and Councillor Taylor, you can respond and then we'll go to Councillor Magoon. I, I think you're correct, although I won't speak for myself. But the other part that I think we would probably concur on is that the, the words written here that on the one off street parking spot for two rooms was okay too. So it sounds like there's a, a, an express will anyway. It hasn't been uh, achieved through consensus, but it sounds like there might be a will of committee to uh, uh, uphold the understanding that there is a one off street parking per two guest bedrooms and that it applied to both principal and non-principal residents. So my suggestion would be just because of the confusion that's around this, that that be captured in a motion. So when it comes back to us on May 3rd, uh, we, we, we can see that and there's a direction to administration that that's the accurately captured bill of council. So if that is a thought and something somebody wants to throw out there as a motion, uh, I, I would suggest that's a good idea. Councillor Magoon. Yeah, and I'm only going to speak to uh, my opinion based around what I've heard in the parking right now uh, and some of the public feedback we had last time. Is that I, respectfully, I do think there's a bit of a difference uh, between somebody's principal residence where they have a suite uh, and another <laughs> residence that they don't live in full time. Um, you know, I, I try to think about the setup of the majority of our houses in this town. Um, and I think about sort of how difficult it would be to rent out a couple of rooms downstairs, um, you know, if the family who lives there is already utilizing the, you know, the parking pad. And then we're going to mandate that they have to use, you know, uh, maybe one or two off street stalls. Well, those properties don't have that. And unless I'm misunderstanding this bylaw, you know, I, if I have, you know, two or three bedrooms downstairs and I'm going to rent them out, uh, it sounds like I need you know, and it's my principal residence. If I need a couple extra off street parking stalls and I'm already using my pad, well then my, my idea for a home business is, is gone. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that there, there is a bit of a difference if I'm using a residence as essentially a business and I don't live there versus, you know, I, I rent out my basement because I want to make a few extra bucks. That's just my, my personal feelings. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Magoon. Uh, just before I go to Mayor Michaels and then Councillor O'Hare, she will go to my CEO, Alan. Sorry, sir, I'm fine. Okay, good. Okay, Mayor Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure how we'll gain consensus for this, um, but I feel like there's there's two elements here, and I, and I, and I do want to thank Councillor Taylor for saying he was like speaking for himself, because I know ICO Hamlin had alluded to that there was an appetite to have it unlimited <laughs> parking. I actually share a bit of the same concern as Councillor Magoon. If it's not your dwelling, I like keeping it the way it's worded now and maxing it at two, 
because that dwelling does not have residents who live there. They're forced, if they have a three bedroom room, they're forced to do two parking st stalls and they still have the street. For me, if, if it gives two parking stalls, the street, no one else lives there. That to me is, is decent. That's pretty close. I am afraid of the, the parties that come with six cars, but that's that's going to be a bit more challenging. But if you're if there's nobody living there and it's two two rooms, I'm I'm actually I'm I'm going to support. I I believe the to to, to keep it the way it's exactly written. Nothing else. But the way it's exactly written also maxes it at two because that our land use file speaks to that. So that's something to clarify for the group that if you're on the opposing side, I believe we'd have to give direction that there's no maximum because currently there'd be a maximum is my understanding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilor Lavares. And I don't mean this combative, but my, my comment is that, so in one instance, um, you say, oh, well, if you're gonna be using all of your parking for you and your family, you can let your business's parking spill out onto the street. Whereas if you're not using that, then your business parking has to be on your property. I mean, if you're going to park your business on a public street, in my view, that's problem. If you want to rent out a couple of rooms in your basement, it's not up for your neighbors to not have a parking stall because somebody's parking there because you're earning rent on your property. These are, these are businesses that are happening in residential neighborhoods. My view of it is you err on the side of the people who aren't involved in that business. Uh, these places generate significant revenue, and if some of that needs to be taken to, to build another parking stall, then that's what I think this business should do. That's my humble feeling on it, because when I knocked on doors, people who lived beside these places said it sucked. So committee, again, just to be able to move forward uh, without just continuing to talk around the subject, if there's a will to make a change or not make a change or whatever, I, I would suggest that there's a motion thrown out there and then we can get the will of council and move on. Maybe, Councilor Lair. Thanks, Mr. Chair, I will make a motion. And I don't know who I'm directing administration at this point. Uh, it's likely just a motion to amend the draft level, if that's what you're going for. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Item T. Yeah. To amend the well, here I'll get the section. Are we talking about so the park, parking section? Is four one T four four one T correct? Four one T T is a top four one T and we'll be correct the number is Um, uh, to require parking a parking stall for every two rooms i think that's a period in the so, residence so if i may councillor Roberts, that's that's pretty much what it says now oh it says provision of one off street parking space per two guest rooms is required okay not to be limited by the land use bylaw Is that the right wording? Sure. Yes, please, Sir Taylor. The other confusion we had, you might want to put words, is that there could be no difference between parking between the principal and the non principal residents. I think that's what you meant. Uh, that is what I meant, but I if we want to say that because of all the confusion. Sure. Uh, yeah, if that was the intention, Councillor LaBerge, I would. Yeah, I would suggest adding regardless of principle or not. Okay, so residents. after the word two rooms, we need to add the words then. 
uh, whether principal or non principal short term rental. Do you understand the intent I see over here? Yes. Non principal? Yeah. Short term rental. I think whether it's W H E. W H E A P A L. Yeah. No. No. W H E. Oh, sorry. Take it there. That council of I ICO have one's a service that they'll break it and make sure it's legislatively compliant before it comes back. They understand the intent. Okay, committee, we have a motion, so we'll uh, keep the discussion to the motion for now until it's called question. Any are there any comments, questions? Okay. Oh, Councillor Taylor. I too heard in my uh, uh, campaign uh, people upset with the parking, people that weren't affected, the people that were nearby these businesses that were affected by the parking that was going on in the streets because these people that had businesses didn't provide for the parking of their business. And that to me is an obligation of you. If you do a business, you should have that parking there. Say, regardless of how many RVs you've got parked there. Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm struggling with this one, but I may have been convinced with the concept that you're running a business in a residential area. I'm trying to think of the examples. I, for smaller homes, I just, it'll be quote unquote uglier to, have to, to build these parking pads, but at the same time, if there is a seven bedroom home with only two parking spots, that's my challenge. But I, I, I don't know, in hearing all of the debate, I think I can support this this way. And uh, yeah, then I'll give it another week before it comes to regular and see if there are any scenarios. It's a, it's a challenging one. To me, it's not a, a hill to die on. Uh, if it's extra, uh, conditions for somebody to run a business in a, rent, a residential area. I kind of like that now. So thank you. Mayor Michaels, go to Councillor Taylor and then Councillor Magoon. If it helps you during the uh, hearing or in collecting information for the hearing, we, we and, and looking at the bylaw, we do know that there's only one booking per, uh, per unit. And that uh, the people that did show up did say that it's very unusual for Usually everybody shows up in one car. It's like unusual that two cars shows up and it's extremely unusual that more than two cars would show up because you, it's only one booking unit per house and you wanted one booking unit per house. So you didn't get that mix of say, teenage boys in one room and then family in the other room and then everybody sharing the bathroom or whatever it is. So that, that's gonna be extremely unusual where there's actually gonna be a need to have more than two parking stalls. So that was the information I got. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Councillor Magoon. Like the mayor, I'm struggling with this one. I think the area that I'm struggling with the most right now is that last section where it says not to be limited by the land use bylaw. I, I'm not sure legislatively of sort of the impact of that and sort of how that plays out. Um, yeah, if, if our ICA wants to comment on that, I, uh, I just, I don't know. If I could sort of throw you to the members of the committee, um, the land use bylaws, <laughs> they restrict all sorts of development. Your, the size of your lot determines the site coverage, your setbacks, it determines how much parking you can put on and off a property. It determines the, if you can have a suite or a duplex or a condominium. Um, so there are all sorts of regulations that govern development throughout the town of Hitman and any municipality. All this is doing is just confirming that. And the intent is always, and I like the language I'm hearing from council, 
from the committee, excuse me, the intent is simply to protect the rights, particularly in residential areas of adjacent property owners, and trying to balance that off one against the other. So making accommodation for certain uses within residential areas, but putting conditions in place. And, and that does mean that it would not be unusual that certain people are going to come and make application. And let's say theoretically and speaking with staff, are told they need an additional parking stall and they take a look at access and fire hybrid street street furniture access and they go I can't put another parking stall in here well then they they have one fewer bedrooms and that's just a function of how a land use by law operates and how it controls development within it's not unusual it does happen quite frequently and it is intended intended to balance the rights of everybody within these residential areas so um I, to, to Councillor Magoon, to your, to your comment, we would certainly bring this back and ensure that anything that we propose here for second reading, it complies with legislation, it doesn't contradict legislation, and so that's why I'm not uncomfortable with the way that the language is worded. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Magoon. Councillor Reese. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you, sir. Eddie, anything further? All right, we can see the motion again, please. Uh, Councilor Marish has moved to direct administration to amend the draft bylaw 1162, section 5.0, 4.1T, to require parking stall for every two rooms, whether principal and non principal short term rental, and not to be limited by the land use bylaw 1088. Committee, all those in favor? Carried unanimously. So back to the main two. I think I had Councilor Taylor in there a long time ago. So we'll go back to school. Yep. Whatever you like. Oh, it's going to be tough. Right. The smoke and CO2 detectors have to be interconnected. Or is it only the smoke detectors throughout the building? Because when I look at section 32420, it just refers to smoke detectors. And that's the section of the building code that's quoted. So does everything have to be interconnected together? Or does just the smoke detectors have to be interconnected together? Why, if everything has to be interconnected together, does the building code number that's referenced only refer to smoke detectors? Councillor Taylor, I see you all handled. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm just uh, going to ask uh, Mac, are, are you still with us? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going yes, to try and just, I'm not sure if you heard Councillor Taylor's question, so I'm, it's a good question, but in terms of the interconnectivity of smoke alarms, we do understand that to be a requirement under the Act, particularly in relation to the rental rooms, regardless of the age of construction. Uh, Councillor Taylor, and he can correct me, is wondering, is there a similar requirement for interconnectivity of the CO detector? I honestly, to answer that question through the chair, I honestly don't know. I to my knowledge, only the smoke alarms are regulated. There is a requirement for CO alarms too. Can, I, can I get back to you on that? I, I'll do a quick search here uh, in the building code. If, if I could, sir, and, and we'll allow that. Um, I do not believe the CO detectors need to be interconnected. I, That's I, right. don't, I don't think they do either. Well, then, may I? Pull up. Yeah, Councillor Taylor. I'm wondering, uh, CAO Anna, if you might want to look at the wording then of this section, because the wording of this section could be interpreted that everything has to be uh, interconnected together. Well, CO2 section. and smoke detectors. Uh, and there's another, there's a number, number of problems with the wording of this section. That's one problem. The other problem with the wording of the section is it ties us to a particular date for a building code. Know, and building this is going to last for years so the building code so we might want to generically refer to the building codes at the time but hey councillor taylor sorry don't mean to cut you off but just so everybody can see it's uh 5.04.1 m mm -hmm. sorry 
Councilor Kaler, did you have anything further? Just uh, just the other point was rather than trying to have a date, maybe we should be a little more generic when we refer to the uh, to the uh, building codes. Otherwise, I mean, two thousand uh, building codes are going to change as we go into the future, unless we want to change this every time the building code changes. We might want to consider that. And we might want to consider the fact that the way this is worded says that the smoke and the carbon monoxide detectors have to be interconnected. And I'm sure that's not what we mean because that's not the section that you forwarded us. Thank you, Do we have to do a motion for that? I see you, Alan. Sir, through you to the members of the uh, committee, and I appreciate uh, Council Taylor's comment on this one. My, uh, my suggestion to administration is that we would take 5.0, 4.1 sub M and break it into three items. And, and I'm gonna suggest the following. The first being the insurance of interconnectivity, either by Bluetooth adapter or wireless of the smoke alarms. And we'll keep it generic, I do agree. We don't want to reference a particular issue of the, uh, of the Safety Codes Act only to have it subsequently amended. Uh, the second one I'm going to suggest is separately deal with the requirement for carbon monoxide detectors. And then the third one being specifically about the requirement of, of marked fire extinguishers. Um, I, I understand the intent around occupant, rental occupant safety on this matter, but we'll break these into three separate ones and we will confirm on, I'm 99% sure on the CO detectors, but we'll confirm that when we bring this back for next uh, Tuesday. So Councilor Taylor, again, I would suggest if that's what you want to see, that it's countered by motion. Make sure that there's a will of the committee that they agree that that's the change they want to see. I'll go to, I'll go to Ms. Walker in the meantime. Ms. Walker. Yes, thank you, through to Chair, through to Council. Um, well, Mac is looking up the building code. Um, when I was checking under the new products out there, first alert, I was just checking now, first alert carries these interconnected uh, Bluetooth systems. And I was sure that they had said interconnected carbon monoxide as well. So, but again, yes, we would have to confirm that. First alert. Thank you. I have it. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Bo uh, sorry, Chief to vote drop first. We'll be able to shed a little light on that discussion. Okay, so the stand data uh, that was issued an information bulletin that is uh, with regards to internet interconnectivity of uh, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors. If they are a combined unit, they do need to be interconnected if they're if they're not. You just need a CO alarm on the level of the fire burning or the furnace room, uh, the fire fire burning appliance. So if there's a if there's a furnace room or a fireplace, it requires a smoke uh, CO alarm. Um, but if they're a combined unit, which are available now, uh, they have to be interconnected. And I I printed off that copy. I'll make sure that it's attached to the report for. Ms. Walker. Thank you, Chief Bodrop. So I guess I would have a question for administration and because Councillor Taylor's concerns are addressed by code and council's opinion doesn't really matter since they're addressed by code unless council wants to, uh, uh, wants to mandate uh, limitations that exceed those that are in the code. It's probably not something that needs to be captured by motion because it it has to be code compliant. There's no choice. Is that correct? Sir, through you to the members of the committee, that is correct. However, administration can better explain sub M, and we will undertake to do that when this comes back. Okay. Councilor Taylor? May I just confirm that C intent is to follow the building code? Yes. We we absolutely have to. We can exceed the building code, but that's a whole different thing of enforcement and compliance monitoring. And we, we really don't want to go there. So the intent is that uh, the town of Hinton in this matter will meet the requirements of the Safety Codes Act. Taylor. I don't see the need for a motion. I mean, this is a simple wording, you know, something that smoke and carbon detectors could be installed as per the applicable building codes at the time of construction. 
That's pretty simple. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Councillor Taylor, can I be anything further on the smoke and carbon monoxide detector? Oh, okay. Committee, anything further regarding the dialogue? Uh, Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Michaels, and then Councillor Peter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess this is perhaps our opportunity. Uh, since we've reverted back from a non principal residence being able to operate, now I'm curious of what do we want to do as a council? Uh, what do we charge them? What the fee is? There's a recommendation on page two of the report to potentially increase it from uh, 285 to 560. For myself, uh, uh, other some other communities uh, charge uh, short-term rentals um, their uh, non-residential tax rate. Canmore charges three times the residential rate uh, because you're operating a business essentially especially if it, well for either whether it's your principal or non-principal uh, i think there's two ways to tackle that it's either looking at the fee uh, is the fee of 560 that administration recommends or or that what what we look at um that's the conversation i at the very least want to uh, approve the fee of 560 um if there's no tax implication or we're not looking to to change their mill rates at all i even think the uh primary resident fee of 160 a year is quite low. So um, those are my thoughts. At the very least, uh, I'd like to change that to 560 uh, and looking to see if there's any appetite of council to do anything on that matter. Mayor Michaels. Okay, so we'll confine discussion to Mayor Michaels uh, matter for now. Council Taylor. More than happy to respond. I think increasing the non fiscal residence license to 560 is punitive and probably unnecessary as we now have added a requirement for a property manager so that should address a lot of the concern we have if at a later date we need to increase it for maybe extra enforcement or whatever fine but i say punitive because it's not based on hard locally available data but rather on the assumption that one form of management uh, is to be discouraged um, principal residents more so i don't agree with that councillor taylor councillor LaBerge. um i don't think the two things are related at all i mean businesses pay taxes at 170 percent of a person so on a four thousand dollar on a four thousand uh, dollar tax bill um a business would pay another twenty eight hundred dollars they'd pay sixty eight hundred dollars so if that's in place for every hotel and business that operates in town, I go back to it again and I say, you're going to operate that place as a business. Should none of that come? Paying residential rates for garbage collection, paying residential rates for water, residential rates for taxation, and you're running a business. No other business in town has that advantage. I, I don't know why we would do that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And it just comes down to a to a, a level playing field. Discussion. Direction. Motion. Michaels. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will um, throw out a motion for discussion then. That um that all short-term rentals are charged at the non-residential tax rate and begin there um that um bylaw 1162 uh incorporate that all non-principal and principal residents a non uh, pay commercial. A, a commercial or non residential tax rate That's regarding property tax, correct? And, and if I can speak to that, uh, yeah, we'll just you want to speak to it first or uh, make sure that they put it after first. Short-term rental 
to pay a non-residential tax rate? Correct. Do you want to specify the amount? Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the amount's already uh, one, our, our split rate is 1.72, so it would be 72% higher. Okay, did you want to speak to it? Yeah, I, I begin there. I wanted to hear from the rest of council. If, if there's no appetite to change it at all, I want to hear that. If there's an appetite to find something in the middle, we'll hear that. I, I, I don't even know if this is my preferred choice. Uh, I just believe that uh, the way it's currently uh, structured at 160, and 285 uh, per year is just too low. And I see other municipalities going uh, one direction quite far, some go in the middle. Uh, for me, again, uh, the same concept of parking. If we're going to allow somebody to have a commercial business to, uh, and, and it's a, a lucrative business, uh, I still want a mechanism to balance the amount. We don't have an, a, a limit of development permits. Uh, uh, I know we're not there yet, but again, it's it's about finding that balance and, and creating a, a, a fair playing field with whether it's the hotels uh, in our community. To, to me, it's important to find that balance in the way it's currently in uh, the proposed bylaw. I feel uh, those rates are simply too low. Uh, so I'll begin with this and see where uh, the will of council lands. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Michaels, okay. Councillor Race, and then myself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my question to admin is, people who run home businesses like hair, massage, consulting, are they charged <clears throat> commercial or residential? Sir, through you to the members of the commission, they are not. And I, I would ask for a bit of time for us to, con to, to in investigate this further. I am not convinced that we can charge residential properties a non-residential mill rate. I'd have to investigate that further and bring it forward for council. Um, the intent of these uses, whether it's home-based businesses of any level or assortment, and even what we're considering for short-term rentals within residential properties here in the town of Hampton, the underlying land use district remains the same. It's residential. And I do not believe the assessor can differentiate that. I will investigate it because I I'm curious because I, I do hear what uh, the committee is saying and, and I I am aware of how some other communities have addressed this, but I'm not sure that it's been through their tax rate. I think it's been through another avenue, and I'd like the opportunity to investigate this further. Um, I. I just have concerns with how this is proposed, but that's strictly, I get the intent. It's just administratively how we would accomplish it that I, I need to investigate some more. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Race. So that was the point that I was going to bring up to, I had concerns about how that would be applied, if that would require a change in zoning, if that would happen, what that would entail. Because my understanding is the communities that do do it that way have rezoned portions of their community as mixed use or direct control or something where they allow uh, businesses regular businesses in zone in areas that were previously zoned as residential so i would personally i i would like to for ICAO Hamlin to not take off down the path of uh, doing investigation on this, unless this is something that council gives direction to investigate, because I, I too appreciate the intent and understand the intent of it, but I'm concerned that it's uh, opening up a can of worms that maybe weren't uh, initially considered in, in trying to bring this forward as, a, as an action. Oops, sorry. Did, did, was that direct to ICL yeah. Hamlin? Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with that being said, and, and, and Canmore does have uh, zones, they like nodes that they can do. So it seems like that's conceptually what allows them to do that. With that, if there's no opposition, I'll withdraw uh, this direction uh, and, and go a, a different route, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Michaels. So, committee, Mayor Michaels has requested to withdraw his motion. Is there any opposition to that? Okay. Seeing no opposition, that motion is withdrawn. Mayor Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll put a, a direction on the floor. Uh, that's uh, bylaw 1162 reflects a rate 
of uh, $560 for non-residents or non-principal residents annual business uh, license fee. And if I may speak to them, Mr. Chair. Yeah, if you just want to have a look, make sure that it was captured correctly. And then if you want to speak to it, or if we could see the motion, Ms. David Campbell. So same concept, I'm, I'm trying to gauge the appetite of council on where do we want to begin the first draft. I personally think this number could be, uh, my, my minimum is 560, uh, and I think it could even be higher. And again, it plays to the, the balance of uh, you're having a, a commercial business in a residential area using that property, uh, and, and albeit difficult to uh, make everything equal on, on every level for private businesses, businesses that uh, work out of their homes, short-term rentals. It, it is challenging, but to me, uh, uh, intuitively, uh, it seems that we need a mechanism in order to balance uh, uh, that approach. So uh, for me, uh, I'll begin with 516 and see where council's at. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor Michaels, I have Councilor Haas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to speak in favor of this, and, and it goes down to a lot of what Council Burr said about, you know, the fact that they're living in a residence but still paying, you know, residential costs on garbage and water and all those things. And I think it's reasonable uh, compensation, uh, you know, to, to run a business in those residential areas. Um, it's not their principal principal residence, and, and it is quite lucrative. So uh, I, I would be in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hoss. Just before I go to Councillor LeBear, sorry, just quickly, I just want to confirm, was the 560, is that for everyone or is that just for the non-principal residents? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just for the non-principal okay. resident, residents yeah. at this time. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor LeBear. Uh, yeah, I won't be speaking in favor of this. I don't think it's high enough. Sorry? I'm sorry I didn't hear this. I don't think it's high enough. Thank you, Councillor LaBerge. Committee, anyone else? Uh, both Councillor Taylor and then Councillor Haas. Sorry, Councillor Magoon, did I see you? Initially, it went, yeah, please, Mr. Okay. Chair. So Taylor, Haas, and Magoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's it this... Taylor, Taylor, Haas. Oh, Taylor. sorry. No, that's okay. Councillor Taylor. One's kind of a question. What, what was the fee that we went to the public hearing with? I believe it was 2000. Look, yeah. It seems to be a lot of head nodding. So I guess. Could let's... administration answer the question, please? Sure. Yep. To administration, what was the original okay. uh, uh, non principal residence fee that council proposed? Thank you. Sorry, just one moment, uh, Ms. Walker. Um, we'll have Ms. Walker speak to that. I do want to just clarify for council on this no matter what the amount ultimately is that this will be reflected in the fees and charges bylaw. So a separate amendment to that fees and charges bylaw, it won't actually be in this bylaw. So we don't have to always change this bylaw in the future if that changes. Um, Ms. Walker, what were we proposing for the non-residential? Yes, thank you, uh, CEO Hammond through to chair. Yes, and we ended up um, uh, revoking that motion at the next meeting and I believe it was 2000 I don't have it in front of me either we started out and just kind of threw out numbers and I think it landed on 2000 and uh, and then we ended up um, taking it off the table is that good for now Councillor Taylor well the administration could look into it and come back later I'm sure later this evening like I'll just have to look up past minutes. My copy of the draft bylaw that we were given at the public hearing said that the uh, license fee was a 160 in the document. 
That is correct. That is what a business license application fee is for a business uh, for in town and for non-resident is 285. That's what our existing fees are, as well as $75 for a development permit application for a home-based business. So those are those fees, but the proposed non-residential fee of 2000 was something that council was exploring at the time. And then they decided, no, we're not gonna, um, we're gonna take non-residential uh, out of the bylaw. And now we've since reinstated it. So now we're looking to see what, what would be a fair charge. I also do wanna uh, remind council too, that all short-term rentals do require under the provincial law, uh, provincial government, they do have to pay a tourism tax levy now. Um, I don't know what that cost is, and, and it, it, it's trying to follow like the, the hotel motel tax. Uh, I, Jen might be able to speak to it because I know that she has to pay that as well. So, uh, yeah, just before that, though, if I, if I may, I believe that when we got the first draft, there was a motion that actually passed that the fee for non-principal residents was going to be $2,000. However, later in that meeting, there was another motion that passed that non-residential short-term rentals were not going to be permitted at all. So it made that first motion moot. Then we had the public hearing and out of the public hearing came a will of council that I believe that was that passed to reinstate the non-principal resident short-term rentals. Correct, Councillor Ostashik. And in the motion made, uh, Council did not specify a number. They just said um, that Council direct administration to include non principal residents into the draft bylaw number 1162. And that was at the March 15th regular Council meeting after the public hearing. So we didn't include a, a cost there. What? So this be whatever it ends up being. $502,000 is in addition to the business license fee. Sir, I'd like this for you to the members. This, the, what we are looking to see, is, is there an appetite of the committee for a higher amount for the business license fee for the residential or non-residential short-term rental provider? So it's not in addition to, it's just, in, it's potentially increasing it from $160 to what council may wish to better reflect this activity. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. We have Councillor Haas and then Councillor Magoo. I guess I just have a question for Councillor Diverge because he says it's not high enough. And I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what would be a more reasonable? Because I'm not against it. Well, I made the motion at $2,000. Right. And again, I go back to it and I say, if property tax is the gauge, say an average home tax is 3,000 bucks, a business would pay 70, so another $2,100. Um, so on a $3,000 tax, a business pay 5,100. And uh, so when I do the math that way, it doesn't take long to get to be $1,500 being the the differential number and it's preferential to use a number like that than to go to tag just gets complicated because it's non credit what portion of the house is being rented out how do we adjust we just half the house quarter of the house so it gets to be really complicated and i think if he's just a simple way to do it thank you thank you councillor haas councillor magoon and then myself yeah, thank you mr chair uh regarding the 560 if i could just ask administration the report on page 10 of 62 or page two of five of the report, um, it mentions that administration recommends $560 uh, based on other communities that charge approximately $400 more. Um, is I'm assuming then from that part of the report, this is uh, this $560 is a bit of a best practice across other communities, is, is that it? Thank you through chair to, to council. Again, there, there are the bigger communities like Calgary, Edmonton, Canmore that, that have these. A lot of other municipalities are slowly trying to integrate these into, into their community. So there, there's not a lot to go on and everybody's 
kind of all over the map. Um, but this particular, uh, I did notice uh, Kelowna, again, not all Alberta, but Kelowna and another BC place were approximately a $400 difference in their fee. So I was trying to come up with something that was um, maybe best practice out there for what there is, which is not a lot on the market at this point, but uh, ultimately it's the will of council in this regard. Thank you. If, if I may speak to the, the direction, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm I'm going to support uh, the mayor's direction that's on the floor right now. I think uh, $560, uh, it's a good start. This is a bylaw that we can re-examine at a later date and see if it's necessary to, to increase or decrease. But again, just trying to put on the hat of, okay, $560 across the whole year, you know, divided by 12 months, how much are you actually paying for that business every month? Well, if your business isn't turning over a hundred and some dollars every month, maybe it shouldn't be in that business, right? And I think that's really reasonable. I don't know if I'm I'm comfortable getting up into the thousands at this point. Um, I think 560 is a it's a nice middle ground considering we were uh, thinking about not even allowing them to exist at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Magoon. I have myself next. I have a question for Councillor Labarish and. So my question isn't directly related to the motion that's before us. It's still relevant because depending on what the answer is, is going to affect how, whether I support this motion or not. So Councilor Gobert, she would said that um, 560 wasn't enough and that you, you would likely support something higher than that. My question is the, the something that's higher than that, would that apply to the uh, non-principal owner as well as principal owner? And I ask that because to me, they're both, they're both businesses. They're both operating on the same model. They both have the potential to make significant amount of revenue. The only difference in one model, the owner lives there. The other model, the owner doesn't live there. So Councillor LaBear says that's correct. I mean, in my mind, they would be exactly the same. Whether you live there or you don't live there. I mean, you're choosing to run a business. And, and there are homes where they have physically separated the two spaces so that they can operate completely independent of one another. And so I think in that reality, now maybe that number difference uh, varies because it's not the whole home, but uh, in general terms, in my mind, those two businesses are equivalent. They're operating um, uh, in the community on public asset. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. And just in my humble opinion, of course. Yeah, no, I wanted to have an understanding because it, it like I said, it, 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 it affects whether I'm going to support this motion or not. So having heard that, I, I won't be supporting this motion because I do agree that it, it certainly could be higher. Both of those models have the potential to make a you know, significant amount of revenue compared to most home-based businesses. So if we're going to look at doing a significant increase in the non-principal owner fee to be able to operate a short-term rental, I think we need to take a look at the at the uh, uh, principal or principal residence uh, fee that we're charging as well, and maybe we need to revise that. I, I wouldn't be in support of having a huge differentiation between the two because I don't see them as being markedly different business models. To me, the only difference is. In one, the person lives there, and in the other one, they don't live there. Because council's decided that the fee structure isn't going to be implemented as a punitive model to try and dissuade non-residential owners from having short-term rentals, then that's out of the argument for me. And to me, now it's just impact on services, impact on, on, the, uh, on the enjoyment of property by others, by neighbors. So to me, the conversation's changed quite a bit. So thank you for that. I'm going to go to Councillor Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, uh, when we first started talking about this in our first meeting, the information that we had was uh, short-term rentals or home-based businesses like this brought 11,000 visitors to our town, 11,000. So when you think of all those people coming to our town and all that money going who are running these establishments, I think 560 is pretty low. So um, I would not support this one. I may support one with a higher fee, but not this one. Thank you, Councillor Reese. 
<clears throat> committee, is there anything further? <clears throat> okay. so nothing from committee. If you can see the motion, please. Uh -huh. Mayor Michaels has moved that bylaw 1162 reflect a rate of $560 for non principal resident license fee. Committee, all those in favor? Opposed? That was not carried. Uh, head, sorry, I had Councillor Taylor, I had you on cue from Google. No, you're good. Okay. Committee? Could we take five minutes? Sure. Yep. I'll uh, we'll call a five minute recess. We will reconvene at 6 15. Nice call.